Hey, David, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. You are officially being recorded and live on Facebook. So okay, when you cool, are thanks. prepared to start, the floor is yours. All right, so put up inside. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Patricia Smith. I am the Public Information Officer with the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, we're here today. This is the last in a series of uh, talks that David Bennett has been giving uh, at our request uh, because we are celebrating 200 years of fisheries management and conservation in North Carolina. Back way back in December, on December 30th, 2020. Two, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly passed the first statewide marine fisheries law. It involved oysters and uh, uh, to, uh, prohibiting uh, export of oysters and uh, talking about the types of gears that could be used and not. Um, so we are very excited. This is the last, again, this is the last in the series and we're really anxious to hear about the roots of our recreational fisheries. So hi, um, yeah. Sort of rearrange this a little bit. All right, so hi, uh, thanks. Yeah, my name is David Bennett. I'm the curator of maritime history here at the North Carolina Maritime Museum, and um, today I'll be talking about um, early recreational fishing in North Carolina. Um, primarily, uh, we'll be discussing the the late 19th century, the early 20th century. Those are periods. Uh, that tend to get ignored when it comes to recreational fishing in North Carolina and and probably, you know, recreational fishing beyond North Carolina as well, but it is um, a relevant topic and I, I find it an interesting topic and I hope that you all will find it as well. So, all right, and uh, before I go any further though, I would like to um, just uh, thank the H2O captain EcoTour for um, sponsoring the, the live stream uh, for this uh, so people can uh, enjoy this on, uh, on, on Zoom. All right. So um, I'm basically going to give you a quick outline what I'll be discussing today. Uh, I'll be discussing where people went fishing um, in North Carolina uh, during this early period, uh, the species that were targeted. Um, where people stayed, the watercraft they used, um, what the fishing experience was like, both inshore and offshore, um, the issue of uh, fishing guides, and then I'll have some brief notes on some uh, famous fishermen who came through uh, eastern North Carolina uh, during this early period. So uh, some important sources that I was able to exploit to really help tell this story where the early um, outdoor sporting publications of the period, publications like American Sportsman, Breeder and Sportsman, Forest and Stream Magazine, The Rod and the Gun, um, those are really great publications, particularly Forest and Stream Magazine. Um, they really covered a lot on hunting and fishing in Eastern North Carolina during those this early period. Uh, newspapers are pretty important as well. Um, and archival sources are important as well, although I, I didn't have time to quite exploit the, the archival sources, but they are there for the future. Um, and these, these magazines, um, these sporting outdoor sporting journals, they're so important because they give more information than probably what you would get today from a sporting publication. Uh, um, they gave information on travel instructions. So how do you get into, you know, some of these isolated parts of Eastern North Carolina before there were, you know, trains and before there's, um, you know, airfields and, and roads and bridges? Um, you know, how, how do you, um, you know, wh when do you go fishing and where do you go fishing? What are the best times of year? Um, what type of gear do you use? What type of bait? Where do you hire the guides? Who are the who are who? Which guides should you hire? Um, you know, what type of attire should you wear for going fishing in these locations? Um, where to stay, etc. All these things were covered in publications like Forest and Stream. They even reported on what type of cultural interactions you should expect with the locals. Um, so, 
it's it they're really fascinating sources um so the so in in the 19th and early 20th centuries the the main uh saltwater angling communities um where recreational fishermen would visit uh were nags had ochracoke uh moorhead city and beaufort uh wrightsville beach carolina beach and southport um those are the main locations. Today, those are also some of the, the main locations that people still go to. Um, and specifically, you know, where were they going out fishing? Primarily during this early period, it's more of an inshore recreational fishing, in, inshore sport fishing. Um, they stuck around the inlets, capes, the sounds. Uh, they, they would seek out shipwrecks and reefs to go fishing off of. The offshore fishing was limited during this early period, but I do have an entire section on just that. The, the, um, so during this early period, there is this idea of more a quantity over quality in terms of catch. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily the biggest fish that people are going after because there's plenty of big fish during those earlier periods. People were fishing, um, so there's sort of an extreme amount, um, but they favored um, fish like bluefish because they put up a really good fight. Um, Cerro, Spanish mackerel, um, blackfish, hogfish, spot croaker, trout, uh, and striped bass were the, the main species people were going after. And here's a great quote to sort of illustrate this point where they have this quantity or quality. Um, a friend, and this is a, a, about a fishing trip to Moorhead City. Uh, a friend and myself caught with rod and reel trolling 327 Spanish mackerel in one day, 1,200 mackerel in five days. I went out alone on the first day of last August and caught three bluefish, 146 mackerel, 183 sea trout, and 75 croakers. I admit that this looks like slaughter, but no one, um, but but not one fish was wasted. They were all given to appreciative friends. And if I had not caught them, the nutters would. So uh, the real sport during this period is really kind of fishing till you're exhausted, catching as much as you possibly can in a single day. Um, and, you know, if, if you don't catch it, somebody else will is kind of the attitude. Um, the, the, there was, this is prior to con really conservation being a big thing in North Carolina. This is prior to uh, recreational fishing being regulated. So there's no trip limits. There's no bag limits. You can catch as many fish as you possibly could during this time period. Um, that's for recreational fishing. There were rules though for commercial. Um, and so here's some images um, from the period, um, illustrations of like a bluefish, a cerro, Spanish mackerel, Uh, sea trout, croaker, uh, pigfish, uh, sea bass, which is sometimes referred to as blackfish in North Carolina, striped bass or, or rock, sheep's head, snapper, or redfish, not rather, redfish rather. Oh, yep, that's not soccer, yep. Um, flounder. Flounder was not as popular, but there are some instances where it was considered sport in North Carolina. Um, so I'm gonna just delve into the watercraft because you know, you're know you going out fishing, it's, it's pretty important. Um, so it, you have this interesting thing. So commercial fishing was, was huge in Eastern North Carolina. It's a very important industry. Most of my talks have dealt with commercial fishing. Um, but during the summertime, things slow down. And that's because there's a lack of onboard refrigeration on vessels. Uh, your fish would spoil quickly. And so uh, the commercial fishermen, as you had resorts emerging in Eastern North Carolina with the rise of resorts, you had commercial fishermen transitioning away from commercial fishing during the summer and then they take up sport fishing uh, in charter boats as a sort of seasonal um, employment so they could stay active on the water year round. Um, so around May or June, 
the commercial fishermen would take their boats and they would whitewash the sails, paint, repaint the boats, um, make them look nice, install cushioned seats. Um, in some instances, they even kind of talk about installing sort of cooler like uh, structures to put some blocks of ice in uh, so you can refrigerate a little bit of fish. Um, and then actually going fishing, hiring a boat from like out of like Moorhead City in 1888, you could hire a boat for like 50 cents a day per 50 cents a day per person. Um, and that fee included your bait, your gear, iced water, um, cushioned seats. In 1894, uh, that price was about $3. So very affordable. Uh, there was also a lot of competition uh, during the period. Um, so one of the earliest uh, vessel types is uh, called Connor. It's a um, sort of, the word is a corruption of the word canoe. They're essentially uh, multi-log dugout canoe boats that were popular in the commercial fishing industry of North Carolina. And they're popular boats going all the way back to the colonial period. These boats were around all the way up to the early 20th century. And um, although they, they started to fade um, in popularity in the late 19th century, but this is sort of what the lines of one of these boats looked like. And this is how they were constructed theoretically. You'd have two or three logs that you would cut, hollow out and then join together in the middle. And so there's a good example of one of these boats being used. There's a fishing trip that was conducted by a northerner. He was staying in Southport and he was staying at Kate Stewart's house, her, her inn in Southport, and he hired a guy, Captain Piner, to take him out in his dugout log boat to go fishing. And uh, he claimed he had a, a wonderful time fishing in the waters around Southport and that the fishing was so good that no one would ever believe him. So there's no point in even telling any wild fish stories, but he says, great. And he also mentioned that Wrightsville Beach is also a great place to go visit. Um, the Shad Boat. North Carolina's official state boat was very popular uh, with sportsmen in the when they visited the Outer Banks. It was a stable um, vessel. It was also sort of ubiquitous along with the Connor in that part of the state. Um, this isn't the best copy of this image, but these guys are actually holding rods, fishing rods. You can't quite tell that well. This. With, with this particular version of the image. Um, then in Carter County in the sort of 1870s, 1860s, there's, and even in, into the 1880s, there's this discussion of these clinker uh, built boats. That's what they refer to them. And clinker is just sort of a lap straight construction. So here you have this, th this um, uh, plank, um, overlapping plank construction boats. Um, as opposed to a Carvel um, built, but they averaged about 22 feet in length. Um, they're open boats, centerboard, um, single mast uh, jib, mainsail with no boom, topsail, uh, pretty probably sort of like a spritzel sort of uh, setup. Um, and they're they're pretty popular during the time period. And um, we have one description that, that mentions that the boats were used for uh, business and pleasure. Sailing were deep, sharp, clinker built, fast sailors, but totally unfitted for shoal water navigation. So they're fast boats and they're stable, sturdy boats in the water, but they're not that great for Carter County, but it's full of shoal water. It might be okay for sailing around Beaufort, but. And so we don't really have images. Unfortunately, we don't have images of these boats, but we do have images of some similar construction that was going on in Carter County at this time. And so we've got this image right here. Um, so, so the technique was, was available. It just wasn't particularly popular. Um, then you have the introduction of the Sharpie around 1875, 1876. Uh, to Carter County. Um, George Ives, he's this uh, 
big wholesale fish dealer who really takes root in Beaufort and Moorhead City, later moves his operations to New Bern, but he, he moves down um, to this area around 1874, 1875 from um, Connecticut. And he doesn't quite like the boats in the area. He doesn't like the dugout boats. And he thinks that he can bring in faster, shallow draft boats from up north, Sharpie fit the bill. Um, he brought down two boats, Lucia and Ella. Um, the locals saw the boats in action. They're like, oh, we don't really know about this one. So he challenges the locals to a race. He beats everybody. And then the boats become really popular. And you get the first Carter County built Sharpies in 1876. And so in 1878, there's 30 boats that were available for charter for uh, recreational fishing out of Beaufort. Two of them are Sharpies. Both of them belong to George Ives, using them in the off season. And then we have this one ad here for the Macon House in Moorhead, where the Julia Bell, which is the first Carter County built Sharpie um, owned by Daniel Bell, um, commanded by Captain D. Bell, is they have a deal set up with a hotel where you can go out and charter boats from the hotels. You can go out and recreational fishing or just cruise around. Um, it's, it's available through these hotels. Um, and this is actually an image of that Sharpie. And so then we got this great quote from this, this northerner who's cruising through um, the sounds of Eastern North Carolina and he comments on the Sharpie and he writes, on the beach formerly only the dugout canoe was used, but now the Sharpie is displacing it, um, but it is slow work and it tears the heart of the Tar Heel to give up his favorite. So this is written in 1888. Um, so more than a decade later, the Sharpie is definitely taking over in Eastern North Carolina um, as the preferred vessel, both for just trade, commercial fishing, and also recreational use. And then by 1891, there's nearly 100 Sharpies in Moorhead City and Beaufort that are available for charters. And um, you've got, got people are building Sharpies purpose, they start building them purpose built for charter trips um, out of Carter County. Um, and you've got people like Thomas Daniels, C.T. Watson, George Ives, they're commissioning boats to be built specifically to take people out recreational fishing. And George Ives, uh, the, the, all three of these guys are some of the biggest wholesale fish dealers in Eastern North Carolina. They're deep into the commercial fishing industry. And George Ives uses recreational fishing to promote his business, but also to promote Moorhead City and Beaufort. Um, he latches on to sort of VIPs that are traveling through the area. They're coming here on vacation and he's taking them to places like Cape Lookout to show how abundant the fish are. And he's getting a hold of um, sports writers and taking them out on fishing trips as well. And so these, these trips are also reported. So there's so much with all these, these Sharpies, you know, you, by 1891, I said, you know, you got over 100 Sharpies out of Moorhead and Beaufort. There's too much competition. Um, the prices are getting um, driven down on charters. And so people start branching out from Carter County. Um, they start going elsewhere. Um, they go to the Carolina Beach, Wrightsville Beach, and Ocracoke. Um, so there's examples of Moorhead City Sharpies that went to Wrightsville Beach where the Nita, the Virginia May, uh, Lila, Lila May, uh, Mary Vance, as well as the Moonfish, uh, all captained by uh, Moorhead City locals. Uh, the Sharpie Robert E. Lee was also from Carteret County. Um, Captain G.W. Smith uh, believes from Moorhead City, and it this advertisement has him taking people um, offshore. Um, Parties taken fishing, trolling, sailing to the Blackfish Grounds. Uh, the Blackfish Grounds in the Lower Cape Fear, um, they're offshore. They extend anywhere from two to 30 miles offshore. These are probably more in the two to three mile range is where he's taking people. Um, and then you've got other vessels as well. In the Lower Cape Fear, they're taking up charter 
fishing. You've got Katie and Daniels, another Sharpie is taking people offshore as well. As I mentioned, there's a lot of competition. Wrightsville Beach, Carolina Beach isn't the only place where these Moorhead City charter boats are going. They're also going to Ocracoke. You have uh, uh, these three Willis brothers that wind, that leave Moorhead and they, they take their business to Ocracoke. Uh, they take people out on fishing excursions. Um, and they even have a small store um, in Ocracoke. Uh, but something happens, we're not entirely sure. But in June 1896, the brothers are driven from the island by um, a, a group of 35 locals. Um, maybe they were causing too much competition with uh, the, the local fishing guides. It's hard to say what happened. We don't know for sure. Um, steamboats um, are operated as well offshore for recreational fishing. They operate more like headboats. So you have large parties, 30 to 40 people going offshore fishing. I'm going to get more. I'll talk more about this later, but here's an example of an ad for one. Uh, fishing excursion to the rocks, as well as the Blackfish grounds on the steamer Passport. Uh, this is May 1890. So leaving Wilmington and going fishing offshore. Um, surf boats were also used, the same type of boats that people were used for mullet fishing. You could actually charter one of these boats uh, from like Wrightsville Beach or Carolina Beach to go out fishing, which sounds nuts, but there's this one instance where I found where like a group of people charter one of these boats and they have to row, I mean, they're in there with a crew of, of other, you know, commercial fishermen are taking them out, but they're having to go out through the breakers um, to go fishing. They go out through the breakers and then they get to the outside and then they have fun. Um, fishing for uh, blackfish and, and pigfish, um, but it's yeah, it's it, it's it's something else. Um, so I'll, I'm going to speak briefly to hotels and resorts uh, because they're really important uh, with recreational fishing in North Carolina. They're really important because they helped facilitate. Um, they helped. They would help arrange or provide boats, boatmen, fishing guides, gear ice. You didn't have to bring all this stuff with you. You didn't have to provide your own boat, your own gear, your own bait. All of that could be provided to you by a hotel. Um, and so you had uh, like the Nags Head Hotel. Uh, Nags Head Hotel goes back to, uh, I think the 1840s. Uh, it goes back to the Antebellum period. Um, Nags Head is burned down in the Civil War, rebuilt um, after the Civil War. It actually burns down several times, but here's a later version of the Nags Head Hotel. And then you have the Tranquil House at Manio, which is a much smaller inn, but it catered more specifically to sportsmen like hunters and fishermen. And this is what it looked like. Um, and then Currituck also had some inns and small hotels that catered to sport fishermen, although there's a lot less information available on Currituck during this period. Um, most of the information, there's a, now I should say, there's a wealth of information on Currituck during this period. However, it primarily deals with waterfowl hunting and, and not sport fishing. Uh, you have to get more down towards Kitty Hawk, um, Nags Head, before you start seeing more about sport fishing on the Outer Banks. Uh, you have the Ocracoke Hotel, um, came up in the 1880s, um, also involved in sport fishing. Uh, Front Street House in um, Beaufort, that was part of the package, was boats and fishing. Uh, these, a lot, a lot of these places, you know, th there wasn't a whole lot here in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And so these hotels and resorts were having to help provide the entertainment, provide people with things to do. Everything was outdoor. Most everything was outdoors during the daytime. People spent their time outdoors, fishing, boating, um, et cetera. Uh, the Atlantic Hotel, the first one in Beaufort, which blew down in the late 1770s in a hurricane, also catered. The Macon House in Moorhead City, which was later um, the Newburn House, the Charles House, 
changed hands and changed names multiple times. And then the Atlantic Hotel, which was the premier resort on the North Carolina coast. It was located in Moorhead City. It had an entire fleet of Sharpies that could take people out. Um, and it, it was really a, a magnificent place. Also Seashore Hotel in Wrightsville Beach and, and others. But you kind of get the idea. And not only would they provide you with, with everything you needed to go, but when you got back from your fishing trip, you could pull up to the dock, like at the Atlantic Hotel, and they had a pier just to take, just to take fish. And it would go straight into the kitchen, and you could have the fish that you caught that day served to you at dinner. So, um, you know, people would clean and cook it up for you any way you want it. And the Atlantic Hotel, which this is sort of a partial map of, um, had some of the best cooks um, in North Carolina at the time. Um, so now I'm going to get into actual experience of fishing. So the inshore and nearshore fishing. Um, so Bluefish and Beaufort Inlet, um, 1871. You've got a group of men uh, with Judge Ellie West from New Bern. Um, Tom Daniels is their fishing guide. They catch 600 pounds of bluefish and some Spanish mackerel in four hours. Um, so as soon as their lines are hitting the water, they're getting a bite. Um, another group caught 400 pounds of bluefish that day. The following day, another boat caught 500 pounds. It's pretty amazing. Um, one of the sports writers writes about blue fishing in Beaufort, and he, he recommends August and September the calm uh, when he says the bluefish are particularly active. And he says they're getting up to 18 inches um, during that period, that time period. Um, and, uh, you know, he mentions that he even himself caught 400 in just a few hours, a few hours. Um, he mentions that you can come back later in the season, December, January, but you've got to have, you got to be tough, he says, because the weather is pretty harsh. Um, but he said you can get 18 to 20 pound bluefish. And this is all like in the 1870s that he's writing. Um, and so th there's this great sort of lengthy quote, but it's all about trolling for bluefish here in Beaufort. It says, fast sailing clinker built sloop, rigged open boat, sailing back and forth in the inlet, just on the edge of the breakers, with the ravenous bluefish snapping at your spoon, sometimes taking it before it barely touches the water, with three other jolly fellows, all pulling for dear life to beat your score, every fellow with a six pounder almost certainly, and at times to have 10 to 12 pounds of animated fish fast hold of your hook, making our muscles crack to pull him in, all constitutes what is in my, to my mind, is the Nuplu Ultra of sport. This is 1874 that he's writing. So the, the competition is between you and your buddies to see who lands the most fish on that trip. And you're just, it, it, it's all very physical. You're they're using hand lines. There's no rod and reel. You got to long line with the hook in artificial lure. Another person's writing about Spanish mackerel. He says, I've never experienced delirium until I saw 15 pound Spanish mackerel leap into the air and a struggle to shake himself free the well-hooked artificial squid at the end of 200 feet of stout line. Also, it's hand lining. There's no rod and reel that's involved in this. You're all just muscling it in. And then, you know, there's this other quote where he's talking about fishing for drum at night and you're, you're falling asleep um, in the back of a boat and just waiting for a bite. And he's, he's talking about drifting off and dreaming. And then all of a sudden you get this really violent tug on the line and you're just abruptly woken from your dreams and you, you struggle to bring the fish in and then you go back to sleep and then it happens again. And, and that's what sort of nighttime recreational fishing looks like um, in this area during that period. Um, so shark fishing was also a thing. Um, it was also done recreationally. Um, it was sort of seen as a last resort um, if you couldn't get anything else, you could at least go and find yourself a shark. And um, 
so we have this one story in a sporting magazine. Um, I think it was in the American Sportsman, where they're talking about going nighttime shark, shark fishing off of Shackleford Banks in a 20-foot boat. And um, they, they baited a large hook um, and they took this huge hook and they had four feet of chain attached to it. Attached to the chain was a clothesline that the, they then tied off to a thwart, so a bench inside the boat and threw it over. And uh, they, they caught a huge shark and he, they wrote um, that they were determined to take a shark home to show the boys, but the shark nearly took us home, which is a distinction with a difference. So the shark almost sank the boat and they had to the cut it free. Uh, there's also an incident where a man is shark fishing um, in, in Wrightful Beach uh, in 1888. Dick Warren caught a six foot seven inch shark and he was pulled 15 feet into the surf by it. Um, he still landed the shark um, and it was hung up and displayed in downtown Wilmington for everybody to see. Um, Flounder gigging, gigging was also sort of considered sport um, in Carteret County during this period as well. A pretty sport practiced along the shore of spearing flounders. A small rowboat is put adrift. A man with a flambeau walks along up to his knees in water. In the, in the bow of the boat, sportsmen stand with slender gigs. Along the bottom by the reflection of the light can be seen white flounders half buried in the sand. They remain perfectly still while the gig is poised over them and never move until they are speared or missed. The only drawback to the sport is that occasionally your torch bearer is stung by a stingray. A stingray is simply a long buggy whip broken out with small pox and filled with steel springs, aquafortis, and needles. When he hits you, lockjaw is the mildest result. <laughs> so you've got a guy walking, instead of, you know, ho holding a, a flashlight or, you know, uh, you got someone holding a torch and dragging your, you know, pulling your boat through the water while you're spearing them. And, and sometimes your guide, your fishing guide's going to get hit by a stingray. Um, and, and they didn't have very good medical treatment for it back then. Um, but there's also a lot of, so I, I've talked a lot about fishing in Carter County so far. There's also some, there's quite a bit of, of fishing um, in, in Dare County. Um, th there's this great um, uh, journal that I found um, in the archives um, by Joshua Davis. And he's this teacher living on the Outer Banks in the 1880s. And he writes a lot about recreational fishing. And um, he, he writes about uh, fishing at, at Ballast Point, uh, which is over in Roanoke Sound here off of Roanoke Island. So this is Ballast Point right here. Um, and he talks about uh, fishing for trout and croaker. And he, said, he, he wrote in one of his journal entries, I tell you, it's fun to hook a large trout and have them nearly pull you overboard. Um, and he, he writes, it's, Ballast Point is one of the best fishing spots um, in the area. Um, again, there's also a lot of trout fishing at or Oregon Inlet. Uh, there's this group of, of tourists that go fish from um, the Nags Head Hotel, I think. Or no, no, they're, they're, they're not. They're singing at Collington Island. Um, but five tourists go out and they catch 800 spot and trout in four hours at the inlet. The, the second day, they catch 300. Then they catch 25 on the third day in an hour. And, and they're pretty disappointed. Um, come the third day, you know, they're not pulling them in by the hundreds anymore. Um, and they're staying at a, at a hunting lodge in Collington for a dollar a day, um, which you can't, of course, stay on the Outer Banks or anything close to that today, even if you just for inflation. Um, fish, there's also uh, a, a quite extensive story that I found about fishing at New Inlet. Um, they're fishing with hand lines again uh, for trout, striped bass, sheep's head red snap or bluefish drum. Um, but they're using all kinds of bait, whatever they can they, they, they can figure out. They're using bacon and clams and, and crab meat. Um, they're using eel and, and mullet. Um, they're even improvising lure, uh, artificial lures out of whatever they have in their kit. They're, they're using um, uh, spoons. Um, to, I guess I have something reflective in the water. Um, to try and lure in fish. 
um, and it's all working. Um, but then they, they're complaining because they're they're basically kind of roughing it on P Island, and they're they're constantly complaining um, because all they have the, all, the only way they can prepare their fish is by frying it up in bacon grease and lard. And they're they're, they're like, man, we didn't plan enough for this trip. We didn't we didn't pack any herbs, you know, to try and flavor our fish or figure out other ways to cook it. Um, there's also fishing at Ocracoke, but it's there's not as much reported on at Ocracook, unfortunately, even though you have a pretty active hotel resort and there's tons of advertising for recreational fishing. It's just, you don't, I haven't been able to find as many stories, but there are some interesting ones. Uh, for instance, um, there's some swordfish that kind of wandered in close to shore and they were able, people were able to catch uh, swordfish. Um, also some large um, bonito were being caught um, off uh, ochre coke as well in the 1890s. Um, now the sort of issue of lady anglers, um, they certainly existed in the 19th century. Um, and they were written about by men. Um, some of the very largest mackerel caught this season were hooked by ladies who are as devoted to the sport as men. And this is about a fishing trip to Moorhead City. Um, and so women are very active in, in going out and fishing recreationally um, in this area. Another writer wrote in 1874, I've known three ladies and one gentleman to take with hook and line 290 trout and drum in less than three hours while fishing in this harbor. Their boat anchored in one spot near the railroad wharf. So probably out um, during this time period, that, that means they're probably out in the Newport River. Um, talking about the, the Moorhead City Railroad Wharf. And now offshore fishing, which is very, to me, is probably one of the more interesting aspects of this talk um, because it's something that when I initially went into this was not expecting to find very much of because most people are using small commercial fishing work boats used in the inner waters of North Carolina. Um, and things like Sharpies weren't really suited to go far offshore, um, but um, out of Wilmington and the lower Cape Fear area, you're, you find that people are using steamboats to go offshore. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they're using them as sort of a headboat experience where you've got 30, 40 people for a trip. There's also a, a few Sharpies that are going offshore, but not very many. And they're primarily heading to what is called the, the blackfish grounds. And there are these hard bottoms that are offshore uh, for fishing. Um, they, they range as far as 30 miles or, or more in some instances offshore. Um, and they're, they're also going, besides blackfish, um, they're also going after uh, red snapper and pigfish as well. Um, but so th these distances, when I say 30 miles or more, they're being measured from the bar at the mouth of the Cape Fear River. Um, so that actually goes off our chart here, um, but it'd be way to the south of the mouth of the Cape Fear. Um, and again, this is sort of blackfish or sea bass, what people are kind of going after, and the pigfish. And the earliest references that I could find to this is 1850. So this, this is antebellum period. This is not late 19th century. Um, this is more mid. Um, but yeah, the steamer Governor Dudley is taking people from Wilmington and they're going offshore um, to, the, to the Blackfish grounds uh, to go fishing. Um, and so from 1850 to 1905, these are a list of all the steamboats that are leaving Wilmington to go take people fishing offshore. And there's, it's not just, you know, it's quite a few. Um, it, it's, a, that's a pretty extensive list. So Wilmington, Lower Cape Fear area has probably one of the earliest deep water offshore recreational fishing experiences in Eastern North Carolina. Um, as I mentioned, also, there are some Sharpies like Robert E. Lee, they're taking people off, but these, this is only probably a couple of miles offshore. Now, the offshore fishing experiences with these steamboats, it, like we've got this story from May 1888, they're going 30 miles um, off 
shore from measured from the the bar at the mouth of the Cape Fear River and they're fishing in 81 feet of water and the group that was on the the boat caught 1700 sea bass snappers and pigfish in one trip and the, the guy writing the story I wrote the hauling and um, the holding in of the lines was so rapid and so heavy was each hull that every man's fingers were cut through the skin. It's, it's all hand lining. Um, and on their way back, they stopped to fish at the rocks um, on their way back to Wilmington to, to get some sheep's head. And this is the rocks. Uh, this is what he's referring to. And it's uh, a giant bre breakwater in the Cape Fear River that was constructed in the 1870s to close off New Inlet. Um, it also was just a really good artificial reef where a lot of people went recreational fishing in the Cape Fear River. Um, and so the, the, there's this other quote about fishing offshore. Uh, the finest sport that I've um, had fishing is off the Cape Fear Bar in the vicinity of Frying Pan Shoal Lightship on the Blackfish Grounds. There, the fishermen uh, may throw the line with several hooks and often pull in to find more than one on his line, and usually he is kept busy, so eager are the fish to bite. Um, and so it, it, it's quite active. People are having fun, but these trips offshore aren't without risk. Um, you know, the, the one, one of the, the biggest problems with steam vessels is their boiler. And I found on at least one trip, there's in July, 1869, uh, one of these offshore fishing trips are coming back in and the boiler explodes. And there are some fatalities um, aboard the steamer Brant. Um, one man is scalded to death in the engine room. Um, another man was severely injured by steam uh, to his hands and to his face. Um, and one man uh, jumped overboard to escape the steam and he drowned. Um, there's other, a lot of other, there's other people that also jumped off board to escape the steam, but fortunately they survived. Um, now fishing guides. Um, th this is a pretty interesting topic. Um, so there's this one guy that I found, Tom Crank. Um, he's, a, he's a real person. He's mentioned um in, in the in the liter sport literature he's up in dare county he's described sort of condescendingly as a whole sorted whole sold poor ignorant fisherman living in a frame cabin on collington with his wife and innumerable children um and they're renting a small these fishermen are renting a small cabin from him for about a dollar a day there's water transport boats are provided and as well as cooking is also provided by uh, Crank's family and they're complaining that everything's fried. Um, and um, he, he is a real guy. He does um, appear in the legal records for Dare County. While he might have been land poor or, or even he, if he didn't have the nicest home, if he had a lot of children, um, the man was boat rich. And he had a lot of boats um, because those are all enumerated in the legal records of Dare County. Um, however, by and large, from the sporting literature of the time from the late 19th century and early 20th century, more often than not, what I find are references to African-Americans serving as fishing guides than I do whites. Um, and this is because uh, many of them are formerly enslaved watermen in places like Carter County. There is a lot of formerly enslaved watermen who had experienced, um, had a lot of experience in commercial fishing and working on the water that it, they just really knew the waters really well. Um, They're great sailors. Um, and there was a large number who are ready to find employment um, year round. Um, and the benefits were they were well paid. Um, you could uh, the, the, some of these these guides got the key portion of the catch because they're catching so many fish that no one could possibly eat all these hundreds of fish that people are, are catching. Um, they're often exchanging their services for sports gear, for fishing rods and line, um, and they're also getting to demonstrate their own skills, their expertise on the water. Um, so even if people have condescending thoughts about them due to sort of the racial politics of the time, 
they're able to show off, hey, I'm as good or better than the best sportsmen. Um, we have some really interesting information on African-American sportsmen. Carter County from the uh, uh, 19th century, uh, Reverend Horace James uh, mentioned that there's over 100 black watermen employed in maritime transportation in Carter County alone in 1864. And um, there's about 50 boats that were being operated by African-Americans and they're making th about $3 a day. And they, they really dominated uh, transportation. Um, and they're also extremely active in the commercial fishing industry. Um, and there's from uh, the rod and gun in, in 1875, uh, there's this article that, that talks about um, fishing guides. If you go to Beaufort and want boats for blue fishing, any of the following men will be available and do your work well. Um, they are all good sailors and know where the game uh, uses. At the head of the list, I place the names Alfred and Henry Boyd, Stephen Turner, Joseph Fisher, but almost any of the colored boatmen will give you good sport. Um, these are all African Americans and most of them um, were formerly enslaved. Um, there's also another reference in 1889, the group that went fishing at Cape Lookout. Um, these guys from Raleigh, they, they said they boarded a Sharpie well manned by gentlemen of African of the African persuasion and set sail um, for Moorhead for the fishing ground. On that trip, they're happy that they caught 253 fish, but they said that wasn't much for Moorhead fishing, but it was something for us. Uh, so no big deal, 253 fish. Um, John Evans was a popular fishing guide um, in Wrightsville Beach. Uh, he was born into slavery uh, on Middle Sound. Uh, he grew up fishing and hunting. Um, after he was uh, emancipated, uh, after the Civil War, um, he went to work as a fishing guide, and uh, he, was, he was hired at a rate of $60 a week, which was good money. Um, in in late 19th century, his meals were included as well uh, by the people that he took out fishing, and he often received gifts. He talk he talks about getting sets of clothing um, from uh, from the people that he took out, and he he mentioned that he made so much money during the summers taking people out fishing that he wouldn't have to work for the rest of the calendar year. Um, also, the P. Island Lifesavers, uh, they had a lot of downtime uh, between looking for shipwrecks, and they also took people out, uh, took sportsmen visiting the Outer Banks. They took them to all the best fishing spots. Um, they, um, so they, they served as fishing guides, and, and we know they were taking the people to places like New Inlet because they, these, uh, the P. Island uh, Lifesavers appear in, in some of the sporting literature uh, in reference to, to New Inlet. Um, and then just going to sort of end this talk on a few quick notes about some famous um, uh, sport fishermen that visited this area. Um, and, and most of them you, you probably haven't heard of, um, but there's Governor Daniel G. Fowl, the governor of North Carolina. He was an avid sportsman. He was originally from Washington, North Carolina. He really liked coming to Moorhead City uh, to go fishing. He even had a Sharpie that was named after him, the Daniel G. Fowl. Um, he would go on hunting trips to Bogue Banks, and he would also go on fishing trips all over Carter County. Um, and he had sort of VIPs from Raleigh with him. All the, the biggest names in business and politics attended him. Uh, governor Elias Carr was also another governor who was really interested um, in fishing. Some of these governors, um, the, the newspapers would joke about um, their cabinet and say some of their cabinet members spent more time carrying around the governor's fishing gear than they actually did working. Um, but um, President Grover Cleveland uh, was an avid fisherman um, and the press sort of bemoaned this point frequently as the country was going through recessions, he was going out fishing. Um, but he, uh, he, he went on trips uh, to, out of Moorhead City um, in the 1890s and uh, he used um, R.P. Evans as his fishing guide. Um, Russell J. Coles, he's a famous naturalist 
And you could argue, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes when he's doing science and when he's doing recreation, because he did a lot of both and he kind of would had a tendency to mix the two. Um, but in 1902, uh, he broke the world record for, uh, land, um, for landing a shark with a rod and reel off of Cape Lookout. Um, it was a 12 and a half foot long shark, uh, 1,200 pounds. Um, as I mentioned, he landed it with a rod and reel. He had seven, 600 feet of line, a heavy reel, and, and a trolling rod is uh is what he used uh and he, he went after all sorts of fish apart from sharks but but this is one that he was particularly famous for and he spent a lot of time on pivers island um uh, at what is now today the the NOAA laboratory um working with the federal government and studying the sharks of cape lookout and that's pretty much all that i have for you all today um and uh, do, do y'all have any questions? I know this is, yeah. With the shark, we have other species of shark, or is it shark? So the, the question that, that I have is um, when people are catching sharks recreationally, did they record the species? Um, sometimes they did, but more often than not, it was just sort of like someone caught a really big shark. And that's how it was often reported. Um, and so it's, it's hard to tell, you know, like some of them could have been um, bull sharks, um, you know, great whites, hammerheads. There, there's all sorts of sharks that frequent North Carolina waters. Um, are there any other questions? Yes. Okay. Your presentation has always been uh, two, two hundred of the questions. Uh, it seems like the recreational fishing in late 19th, early 20th century was more of a tourist trade, people coming, at least so that the mm -hmm. location in the 1750s. Um, was it also popular with the locals, or was uh, fishing more just kind of foreign subsistence uh, for the people who were living in the area? Um, so, the, the, so the, I guess the, the question I have, especially for the people online, is um, with the recreational fishing, sounds like most of it's tourist based. Yes, that is true. Uh, but also the, the question more has to do with the locals, were the locals enjoying it? Yes, there are, you do get stories about locals, but they, like most of the stories will have more to do with like some of the fishing excursions out of Wilmington and Lower Cape Fear. Um, most of the, the literature that's being produced where we get the bulk of these stories are being produced by Northerners that are traveling into North Carolina, um, specifically to go hunting and fishing. Um, and that's where a lot of the bulk of the information is coming from. Um, there are journals in the archives where you have got local North Carolinians talking about going rec fishing recreationally. Um, and I just haven't had the time to really exploit those um, because this isn't my area of expertise, but is it an area of interest? Um, there, yeah, and uh, so also there's the question of, was were the locals more into subsistence fishing? Um, of course, local people in coastal North Carolina were very much involved in subsistence fishing. I mean, that was just part of the life. That's where one of the main pro sources of protein was coming from. And I'm sure to an extent that they were, enjoying it, but I think most of the subsistence fishing that's going on is used, or nets are involved. Um, it's more of a net fishing, uh, so more in line with commercial fishing gear. Um, and then there's also, you know, there's can also be a lot of overlap between subsistence and recreation. And, you know, th there's even debate, academic debates about that that go on to this day. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to say when the majority of the literature is being produced by the people from out of state or or their people coming from Raleigh. Yeah. Um, that, that, thanks for that. Um, and I guess a second question. I mean, you might not have dug into this yet or it just didn't happen. But you go when further into the 20th century, you start hearing about this new story about a species of fish coming or 
coming and going, doing different versions of the program, or we could, uh, or maybe less than you're used to getting uh, right So that even in the mm -hmm. early 1900s. Did you come across any of that in your research for North Carolina in this time period, or, or um, did that, or was that just not observed yet by Pythagoras writing, or did they just didn't want to talk about it because they're really promoting uh, the vision of the closing? So the so I guess the, the question is, and what I've read, what I've researched, was there a lot of discussion about species coming and going, scarcity? Um, yeah, there is some um, discussion of it when you get a little bit more into the 20th century. Um, and but no one can really, no one understands it and they can't explain it. Like there's instances where sea trout they go missing for a while and then they come back and people are in, in the sport literature they're trying to figure this out why are they disappearing for a while and then coming back um, it doesn't make any sense to them um, and the science isn't really developed for it um, there's also debates in eastern north carolina so in the moving into the 20th century so around 1905 you start to see this for the proliferation of, uh, gas, of, of gasoline motors being used in boats. And people are ha having these debates actively of whether or not prop noise from these boats is scaring fish away and making it harder to go catch fish. And so people are asking, are motorized boats a good thing for fishing? Um, you know, should we be sticking to sailboats? Now, that was actually a real thing. Uh, that I found sort of interesting. Um, but yeah, there's some. Um, is there any other questions? Yes, sir. Three unrelated questions. You mentioned a fish called CDRO. What kind of fish is that? Also, you said flounder was very popular. Why is that in your research? Did you run across anything about spirit fishing? Um, so um, I'll, I'll answer the, the, the flounder question first. Um, the um, flounder weren't super popular. Um, they just weren't really, they weren't popular as a commercial species or really as a recreational species. Um, and I'm not ex exactly sure why, um, but there are other fish that were more, that were more popular at the time. So mullet was really popular. The American shad was popular. Um, herring was popular at this time. Um, but as a lot of these sort of other fisheries start to diminish, um, or bluefish was also popular commercially, um, as some of these other fisheries were diminishing, some of these other less exploited fisheries were becoming more exploited as you get closer to, to the 20th century. And, and definitely once you get into the 20th century, that's when the flounder really takes off. And the only discussion of spearfishing in North Carolina that I've come across has to do with flounder gigging. Uh, that's, that's the closest thing to spearfishing. Um, and um, the Cerro, I forget the, Matt, do you remember more about it? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, it, it's, yeah, they're synonymous with kingfish. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of names that people are using that aren't used as frequently. And some of the, the terminology is a little bit confusing because um, what people in North Carolina called fish isn't always what people from out of state were calling fish. And that gets really confusing when you start talking about blackfish because in blackfish, the North Carolinians are usually referring to sea bass, but the northerners are usually referring to tawtaw. -taw. So, it, uh, so it, it's kind of hard uh, to figure out what they're talking about sometimes. Um, any other questions? Yes. But it was sport fishing pretty accessible to the middle class. Yeah, so the, the question is um, in terms of cost of sport fishing and accessibility, um, 
it was very accessible um, in the 19th century, surely be, primarily because of competition. Um, you know, when you have, you know, over a hundred boats out of you know, more had seen Beaufort alone, you know, people are competing, to keep the prices pretty low. Uh, and also you have people that are looking to maintain year round employment. Um, it was very affordable. I mean, even these offshore, I neg neglected to mention that even these offshore um, fishing trips out of Wilmington, where they're going 30 miles offshore, those were a dollar, $1 round trip um, charters. Uh, there's a dollar per person. Of course, those boats are carrying 30, 40 people, but you know, for the individual, it's, it's very affordable. Um, and so you didn't have to necessarily be wealthy. Now, you know, in terms of getting to the coast and afford being able to afford to stay on the coast, that's another matter. Um, you know, that varied. Um, there are accounts that there though of people of various means coming to the coast and staying on the coast, particularly during earlier periods. And a lot of that had less to do with recreation, you know, sucking up the sun, enjoying the waves at the beach. It, it more had, the, it had less to do with that and more to do with health-based tourism. So um, in Eastern North Carolina, we used to have malaria that would break out in the summers. And so in order to avoid malaria, people would travel to the coast. Um, so uh, up in the Albemarle region, it, where it's really swampy, malaria was a huge issue for communities like Plymouth and Edenton. And so people would get on boats and they'd go to the Nags Head. Um, and the community, the tourist community of Nags Head, the beach houses and all that stuff, that started up in the 1830s um, when people were trying to escape malaria. Um, and uh, there's discussions of not only just the wealthy traveling out to Nags Head, but also people of, you know, middle class or, or, or maybe needier backgrounds going to the coast as well to, to try and get some relief. Um, but uh, is there other questions? Nope. All right. Well, um, thank you all for uh, coming to this talk. Really appreciate 